I'm David Holmgren, I'm co-originator of the permaculture concept and I'd like to add my support to the seed freedom movement that's been initiated by uh, Dr Vandana Shiva. The issue of seeds and their uh, importance to future food security uh, cannot be understated and the malevolence of the corporate control of seeds and the associated uh, spread of uh, genetically modified uh, organisms to dominate uh, conventional agriculture are huge issues. But I also want to, I suppose, point out that permaculture has been about creating the world we do want more than fighting against the world we don't want. And both these sides, these two sides of environmental activism are essential. It's interesting in the seeds issue, one of the really powerful ways that we can uh, contribute to the creating the world we do want is of course through seed saving. And the irony is that this simple traditional activity which all peoples have always done everywhere uh, is in danger of becoming potentially a criminal offence through uh, many of the laws that are developing. But of course we're not talking about doing that just as a, as a dissident political statement. We are saving seeds because we literally want to grow them for our food supply and exchange them uh, with other people. So seed saving networks around the world, uh, a lot of it inspired by uh, permaculture activism, have been part of this counter movement to this centralization and uh, corporate buy up and control of the, uh, the larger seed supply. At the next level down from saving seed and growing our own food, when we disconnect from the centralised, globalised food supply system and we start buying from local, um, mostly organic farmers, direct from the producer, uh, and refuse to participate in the system that uh, starts with uh, Monsanto genetically modified products and ends with the monopoly supermarts, that we disconnect from that system, uh, we are not just making a political statement, we are providing uh, a, a very strong message by not participating. And it doesn't take the majority of the middle class people on the planet to disconnect from that system to give it a huge shock. It only takes five to 10% of people seriously disconnecting from that to give them a huge wake up call. So these issues of greater self-reliance and the political fight uh, uh, against the bad things that are happening is, is very, very important. And people should never underestimate uh, the effect of that when we are talking about food, because food is such a huge part of the global economy. It is so central to everything. So it's not like uh, a boycott of one particular product, um, like Nike shoes. We are talking about a whole centralized food supply system, which is essentially corrupted. And of course, the parallel system that starts with home food production, which com with community supported agriculture, with small scale, local and bioregional organic suppliers is the alternative to that. I suppose for many years, as someone who has focused on the positive uh, environmentalism rather than oppositional environmentalism, I've nevertheless made a few observations about oppositional environmentalism in relation to various issues, including uh, genetically modified organisms. And I think sometimes environmental activists have played into the story, the dominant mythology, how genetic engineering is going to bring about this great positive transformation in the world by just saying it's going to bring about a great negative transformation in the world. 
sometimes inadvertently that has played into the idea that these companies are all-powerful all masters of the universe and they have this great and powerful product which is going to transform the world. I think a better story to tell is how these corporations and especially Monsanto which is more committed to this pathway than any other global corporation are trying to sell a defective product. Genetically modified organisms have not produced any of the things that were claimed repeatedly over the last 30 years that they would achieve. They are defective products and corporations like Monsanto are desperate because they have invested so much in this pathway. Of course, a desperate corporation is a dangerous animal. I don't want to underestimate that, but I think it's important to recognise that they are selling a dud product. And of course, the real reason for selling this dud product is that it has this unique financial, legal marketing advantage is that you can put a label on a life form and say, we own that. So it's the, the grasp for the intellectual property rights to life, which is the magnet that is drawing these corporations, not actually any productive advantages from uh, the plants um, that they are uh, breeding. Because in fact, the results of the last 30 years have shown that almost all of their things are a series of disasters. Now, to tell a little story about Monsanto that I don't think is well understood is that their greatest product, of course, is the uh, Roundup Ready crops, where herbicide can be sprayed over the crop uh, because it is resistant to the herbicide. And most people imagine this was a result of some careful plan by the corporation. But in fact, it was a response to their own disasters. That disaster, of course, was the inevitable emergence of Roundup resistant weeds. Now, people imagine that this Roundup ready crops were a result of careful breeding in the laboratory that created this resistance to Roundup that they then put in their crops. I have another story about that of how Monsanto stole that from a farmer in Northern Victoria. Probably other places in the world too, but this particular farmer told me how he'd been using Roundup intensively for 16 years and then discovered ryegrass plants, big healthy ryegrass plants in his crops. And being the sort of farmer he was, he rang up Monsanto with a product complaint. This Roundup is supposed to kill everything. It doesn't. Uh, I have these uh, ryegrass plants. They immediately put him onto head office in the United States. And head office said, don't do anything we'll come to see you straight away. Very shortly, he had a visit from four gentlemen from Monsanto, two plant geneticists and two lawyers. The plant geneticists took samples of, of the plant. The lawyers issued legal threats that if he did anything, they would destroy him. And they took the plant material back to the United States. So this farmer in Northern Victoria was one of the people who created uh, Roundup resistance, as of course Monsanto's ecologists would have told um, their bosses would inevitably happen. And then the corporate strategy was, well, how do we turn this disaster into a product? And that's where Roundup Ready crops came from. So I think this is a great story to tell about how these things are created um, out of one disaster after another um, cascading uh, down into uh, catastrophe and at, we, at least we can laugh um, that they are no more competent than any bungling fool that we would also laugh at.